right, let's jump into it. So last Saturday, we had Giga Chikese v Edson Barboza. Now, coming into the fight, there was a lot of talk around these two fighters because, I mean, one is a self-proclaimed, one of the best strikers in the UFC, and the other is very, very established in Edson Barboza, who is renowned for his excellent striking and who is also renowned for his excellent low kicking. But on the flip side, we have Giga Chikese, who, whilst maybe less known, even has his own kick, the Giga kick, which he stabs into the liver and just ask Cobb Swanson how that feels. So there was a lot coming into this fight and also there was a lot coming into this fight around Giga Chikese because if you don't know a lot about him, he's very, very outspoken with his skill set and we'll come on to why rightly so, but he came into the UFC saying he's the best striker in the UFC and he found it a very, very difficult time to get fights and the best, well, the only one that he could sort of get was Edson Barboza. A lot of people unranked or even ranked didn't want to fight him, even though he kept making those call-ups. And the UFC said, if you fight someone within the top 10, the top 15, and you win that, then you may go into a title fight. But no one wanted to fight him, so he then took Edson Barboza. Which, if you ask me, if you're coming into the UFC acclaiming your striking skills, that's a great matchup for you to prove that, because he is one of the best, like I said. Now, when we actually have a look at the fight, I think it showed to a lot of people, and if you're a little bit unfamiliar with Giga Jacasey, he came into the UFC very, very recently. I think it was March 2020. It was on the Cannoneer Jack Hermanson card. And he's currently 7-0 if you include his last fight. So you can see why there's a lot of conversations around him at the moment. So he, met, he only came in in March 2020, and his thing was fighting for the title and keeping that activity as well, which he's gone to prove because he's fought a lot in that featherweight division. Now, when the fight started, it was really going to come down to not only striking, but I did think if Edson Barboza could impose his wrestling, could impose some takedowns, then I think that was his best path to victory. I felt that if it left standing up, then Edson Barboza may be a little bit short-changed, which sounds crazy, even just saying that, but when I was watching his kickboxing videos before the fight, it sort of went to show. And obviously, I've seen him his fights previously in the UFC, but when I had a look at his kickbox career, it really goes to show the talent of this man. So I think that was his path to victory for Bob Barboza. But at the end of the day, he just couldn't get that off. I don't know whether that was because of the threat of those kicks coming in, because Giga Chikese was so creative, whether that be with knees, whether that be with low kicks, body kicks, high kicks, whether Barboza was a little bit afraid to maybe close the distance and walk onto something, or if he just didn't utilise it. And I think even Giga Jacasey, after the fight, said in his post-fight press conference that he was expecting a lot more of that. But the problem with Giga is he trains out of King's MMA and he attributes a lot of his training and a lot of his talent in terms of his ground game and his wrestling to Benil Dariush. And if you're spending day in, day out with someone like Benny Dariush, then... Your jiu-jitsu game and your wrestling game is going to improve drastically anyway. So maybe even Barboza knew that and didn't even want it to go there. And when it did go there in the fight, he was throwing up Darcy's, Anacondas, guillotines. So he was really flexing and showing off his jiu-jitsu game as well because he's got submissions on his record as well before. So I think that was Barboza's path to victory. Like I said, he couldn't manage to get it off. He was investing in that low kick, which... I mean, obviously, it is always going to be a good investment. It's going to be good money in the bank. And Giga post-fight was actually speaking about how big he was in there, how big of a featherweight and how well he's hydrated because he said he's definitely one of the strongest kicking and definitely the strongest punch in featherweights that he's faced thus far. So, like I said, I think Barboza made some investments with those low kicks. But I also don't think he'd done enough with his hands. I don't think he set those kicks up enough and I don't think he used his hands enough throughout the fight because when he did he looked good and he had those he had those heavy hands as well when he had that power advantage but he just didn't let them go he didn't set anything up with a jab he didn't really throw many combinations and he he was a little bit within that range for Giga Jacasey and he just began to get to work he got the read on him he got the timing on on Edson Barboza and he mentioned post fight that he was just reading his game very well. He said, where, and I guess it's true, where you come from such a high level of kickboxing, where you're solely dealing with those feints or those movements or one particular movement leads to another and he, if he goes there, I go there. 
he was speaking about how clear that was to see and how easy it was for him to see as well. And when you are that elite level kickboxer, those reads do become easy. And even though we're facing such a striker, such a striker like Barboza, that sort of speaks to the level of the man. And if you compare that to someone like Israel Adesanya, who came from that kickboxing background, who is a very, very accomplished striker, and as we know, has beautiful feints, has beautiful sets traps throughout the octagon and really, really makes it difficult for their opponent. And I think Giga Jacasey did just that. I think the trouble for Barboza, where he struggled to get into the fight, not only was Giga using his kicks like we knew, but he was mixing it up so lovely. So where we had Barboza on one hand, who was a little bit predictable, we sort of knew what we were going to see and he didn't really make adjustments throughout the fight. Giga did the exact opposite. He was going low to the leg. He was going inside. He was going outside. He was going to the body. He was going up top. And like I said, he was even throwing knees in that as well. So he really did keep him guessing. And he, like I said, he even flexed his game on the ground and tried to throw up a few submissions as well. Like I said, he ran through some Darcy's and some Anacondas. But he then said as well, he felt like he could have finished it, but his energy resource maybe would have been a little bit more drained and rightfully so because he already had him hurt he was already wobbled he was already a little bit staggered on his feet so when he went to the ground I think it was the correct decision and I think this is where I can see him being a championship being a champion in the future because a lot of the UFC comes down to decision making it's not always being the best fighter it's making the best decisions in high presses high pressured situations and there were other fights on the card where they maybe made that mistake. They wobbled him or it went to the ground and they pounced and they rushed it. Whereas in reality, they were probably doing better on the feet. So they were better off to sort of stand him up. And that's exactly what Giga did. And when it got stood back up, I think that was the beginning and the end for Barboza. Like I said, he became overwhelmed with the pressure. And not only did Giga have the kicks, he has the hands to go with it. He's got some heavy, heavy hands in, in the featherweight division. And I mean, he's six foot as well. So he's got long arms. I think he's 74 reach advantage. He's got long levers. And he's a powerful man. He's been striking all his life. And he's been in martial arts since I think he's four years old. So I think his hands were a little bit underrated as well. And he went to show because he stunned him. He rocked him. And then ultimately, he finished him with, uh, with punches as well. So it was a very, very impressive performance from Giga. And the thing that I liked the most about him above all else outside of the performance outside of his dress sense because he may not look the most fashionable when you see him in there in terms of his appearance but he's got some style geek and i like it and i really really liked his trainers the other day in the press conference i'm a big fan of them but what he did is he jumped on the mic with paul felder and he made a call out now this is so essential and it annoys me so much when fighters don't do this now yes this is obviously for our entertainment and it makes it more fun when we watch a post fight press conference but above all else it does them a favor because as soon as you see a call out if you make an outlandish call out in terms of what your statement your your bold in what you're saying not necessarily always going for the number one guy if you're ranked maybe 10 but if you can have something memorable that's going to be clipped that's going to go on the ufc instagram page it's going to go on people's tiktoks then that causes traction for yourself and maybe you weren't close to getting that fight before with whoever you called out but this constant traction and this constant idea in people's minds causes this friction and then there's more pressure on that other person and they keep getting asked and they keep getting asked and ufc sees the build up around that fight and then sean shelby decides that okay let's make this fight so I think it's always important to rock the mic. It's what Chow always says, and it is so, so true. So I'm glad that he's he done exactly that. And he done it for an absolute savage in Max Holloway. Now, if you felt confident in your abilities, if you're calling out Max Holloway like a performance after that, then you're even more confident in your abilities. And I really, really like that because Max is one of the best strikers in the UFC. And we saw what he done on his last night out against Calvin Cater. And that goes to show not only probably who is the best striker in the UFC, maybe, but for sure who is who is the best featherweight after the title has been has been dealt with with Brian and Volk so that's very very interesting I'm looking forward to seeing how that pans out but one last thing as well which I will mention is what I found very interesting is he spoke about his injuries going into the fight after the fight so he spoke about having a torn bicep a torn meniscus I think he'd done some damage to his ACL he had three broken bones in his hand and 
eighty percent of his camp said you probably shouldn't go through with this. And I know that obviously speaks to his toughness, but it speaks to his mentality and his ability. If I know fighters never really go into fights 100% fit, but there's 100% fit, and then there sounds like 23% fit, which is what Giga Chikasi done. And on top of that, he was fasting throughout his fight camp, which I just found crazy, absolutely crazy. Not only was did he have these injuries, but he was fasting at the same time. So with all this intense training and all this weight cutting, I, I genuinely have no idea how he done that. So hats off to him, number one. I'm really looking forward to that Max Holloway fight, if we can get that made. Let me know in the comments what you think thought about the fight. Let me know in the comments who you think he should get next. And let me know if you think he's all hype chained. But 7-0 with a convincing win over one of the best strikers to ever do it at lightweight is a pretty convincing way to put your name in title implications so as always you know the drill if you enjoyed the content please drop me a like please drop me a subscribe drop us a follow on all those tiktoks and it really does just help me to grow my platform follower by follower and subscriber, uh, subscriber. so share the content like the content and enjoy